Hey everybody, welcome back to the Panel Pursuit. I'm Robert Norman, I'm here with Justin Giorgio. This is actually take number two. We kind of messed up some of the uh, sound recording uh, part of this, so we got a little test run. So if some of this seems a little contrived, it's because we've already said it once. So uh, me and Justin uh, are from a very similar paddling era, starting at a uh, similar time, starting with SUP, transitioning into the uh, sit-down boat, ultimately. Um, Justin is also the person that inspired me to do the paddle pursuit, so it's only right that we drag him onto the show and get him out of his comfort zone. The first five minutes was great because he's a little bit more timid, but I think he's loosening it up a little bit. We put some vodka in his water, so when you see him sipping it, just know that he's loosening up a little bit. So, Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. So, uh, tell us about your history leading into SUP. What drew you into the stand-up paddle world to begin with? Uh, you know, I started, I moved down to Florida. I, I have no family here. I didn't really know anything about Florida when I came here. Um, and I'm a car guy, you know, like I, all I do is car stuff. And I, you know, wanted, I was desperate for something that I do outside and, uh, you know, get to do outdoor things and see, you know, I lived right by the water, get to get on the water. And, um, a friend of mine, uh, he had a paddleboard, and um, I knew of it, you know, about it because of him. Uh, and then another friend of mine and I decided to rent paddleboards at the beach one day, and uh, we it was it was a total failure. Um, they just <laughs> dropped them off, and they're like, "Okay." And one board was way too small, and the other board was, you know, too tippy, and you know, it was just it was what it was. They were like surfboards, mm -hmm. and. Um, and then after that, we went paddling with our friend uh, uh, Kevin, and uh, we went down to uh, this Clam Pass area um, down in Naples. It's a nice little secluded area, and uh, backwater paddling like through a mang mangrove forest. And um, after that, it kind of like got a taste of can I keep up with these guys? And uh, Kevin always would whip our ass, and you know, <laughs> and. Uh, that's where I got got the racing bug, and then I, you know, borrowed a big wing and did my first race down in Naples, um, and uh, got <laughs> destroyed by everybody. <laughs> um, ended up, uh, you know, I'll put this out there: I, I was never athletic, you know, throughout my all my childhood. I rode BMX bikes for fun, but I never did any sports or anything like that. Um, so I was kind of just doing it more for fun and just to get on the water. Um, and I still am. But, you know, I was just, you know, kind of trying to do some races here and there. And there was a couple in Naples at the time. Um, and then that kind of uh, introduced me to some, you know, of the racing community. And then um, Mark Antonasio. <laughs> and I think I got that right. <laughs> I've known him for like 15 years, but I, I don't I don't know if I say his last name night. Yeah, we, we always say his name, and he never corrects anybody, so we always say it differently. And it should become a game to just like butcher it more and more and be like, Athanasio, <laughs> and see if he like says anything. He'd like, probably like that if he did that. <laughs> so Mark, if you're watching, get ready for uh, us butchering your name on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in the sub transition getting into races so tell us about like some of the races that you've done and some of the motivations in progressing through boards seeing the community and you know navigate us through some of that sup time uh so i think you know once i got to meet mark and then i started doing some of the you know training paddles with him um and uh kind of realizing like holy shit this uh, old guy's whooping my butt <laughs> he still does you know but uh you know it that was you know the kind of like okay i need to get like a more serious race board um and then you know mark was uh good friends with brian hovanian um <laughs> and uh he was building boards here in florida um well in california they're shipping them here to florida but uh that's what kind of started the race board craze um i had some 404s in there and uh a fanatic. I think the fanatic was my first actual race board. Mm -hmm. I used fanatic, um, and then I think actually James Douglas still has that. <laughs> I think so. The pintail one. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. He yeah. does. I think. Uh, and that, that thing. It was twenty-seven wide, and I used to fall off it all the time. And 
now everybody's paddling 2019, you know, 21. Um, but yeah, so once I met uh, Brian, that's when I kind of got a taste of custom uh, boards and you can order them, you know, how you wanted them, what color you wanted them. And uh, so I got a couple from him. Uh, and, you know, one of them is still floating around this area. That was the like one of one. Uh, and then my uh, Mahi board, which I loved, uh, that one is uh, down in Naples still. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that kind of all came to an end once I uh, went to the shark bite and got to see what a surf ski was. So uh, my first time meeting, or not meeting Justin, but hearing of Justin is mm-hmm. on a race result. We were both racing in Sarasota, and on the short course, Justin beat me. And I didn't realize that you were being trained by Mark Athanasio at the time. So maybe that's what it was. He, he gave me so much shit for doing the three-mile course. <laughs> He's like, you're going to do the baby course? <laughs> well, you beat some... There's other names on that list that still paddle today. So it was a good race to and get under probably your... Probably a lot of those names are fat, a lot faster than me on a set. <laughs> we'll have to go back and review that. But it's always cool going back in time and seeing like that and looking at some of these old race results and like, man, that person still paddles a decade later, right? So never underestimate like short cores or slow results and stuff like that is that person that day, but five to 10 years from now, you never know where they're going to go. So from sup making the transition ultimately into the surf ski, what was the big motivator in spending all that time and effort in sup and then jumping ship to say, to start something new with the surf ski? Well, you know, the shark bike race, which everybody loved Rob. You know, you should do it again. Rob Merlin, not Robert Norman. So yeah, it's the yes, other round, yes, which yes, we will no. get on here. He'll be in the hot seat. We'll feed him some hot yeah. sauces, and uh, we're going to grill him on. You should do a hot ones with him. <laughs> That's right. We just hit him with pepper spray and, like, <laughs> bring back the race. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so Shark Bite, um, there were some South African guys there. Um, one in particular, I we just were racking our brains trying to figure out what his name was. I'm sure I'll remember it later, but. Uh, he was a big, tall guy on an Epic and he just, he was just smoking me and I was on a sup and I was struggling and, uh, he lapped me and I was just like, what, I don't know what that is, but that's what I want to do. And that's where it kind of branched off. I, I started talking to Jay Rose at that point, um, which I had known him before, but, uh, I started asking him about, you know, surf skis and he had a, uh, a stellar SR. And that's what the first boat I bought, and um, fuck it, didn't work for me super well. I wasn't very comfortable in it. I uh, still can't get comfortable in stellar boats for some reason. And um, <clears throat> I quickly sold it and bought a Nello 550, which was way too tippy for me at the time. <laughs> um, but that's how I got really good at remounting. So uh, when <clears throat> a lot of people make the transition from like SUP into a different sport, usually the the logical progression seems like outrigger canoe because it's single blade to single blade but there are so many parallels in the world of surf ski outside of using the wing blade that's the main thing that's different but having a vessel that is different widths different stabilities for different conditions in sup there's that exact parallel you have ocean boards you know flat water board surf ski is very similar outrigger canoe not so much you have like a one size fits all type of a craft right so what was it like making that transition into the surf ski with the sup? What were some of the parallels with, you know, um, you know the, the boats being similar? And what was the learning curve going to the wing boat? Um, <clears throat> well, you know, luckily I had, uh, we have a resident South African, uh, Murray Hunkinen, and he <laughs> uh, basically showed me how to use the wing blade. Um, and I learned quickly because of him. Um, but it's a steep learning curve and, you know, had Outrigger been as popular back then as now, there's a good chance I probably would have gravitated towards the Outrigger. Um, and I did have an Outrigger for a short period of time and I, you know, we have mostly flat water days here. You know, a big day is rare and especially rare on a day I'm not working. (laughs) So, um, why go slower and flat water? when you can paddle a surf ski. And that's one of the big things that brings people to the surf ski or the kayak in general is when it comes to speeds, it is the apex predator. You have two blades, you have nothing hindering the boat, and its speed potential, it's the highest, right? 
the outrigger, you have the ama or the training wheel, as Justin calls it, yep. and then you have <laughs> you only have the single blade propelling the boat as well, right? So there is a hindrance in overall speed. So when you're looking at performance alone, the Surski makes the most logical sense, right? In uh, past videos in the podcast, one of the topics is the community aspect. So a big funnel for the Outrigger canoe is the Dragon Boat community, the OC6 community, the ability to do two-person boats more frequently in a sports setting. The team aspect forces people to paddle the single blade more. In the surf ski, there is no team component necessarily. You're only doing it for yourself, right? So kind of speak to that when you're doing the surf ski, what is one of the primary motivators outside of personal gain? It's only the, the personal aspect, it seems like. Well, I think from a transitional point from the SUP to a surf ski, the learning curve is steep, but you have the same convenience factor. Mm -hmm. You don't have to deal with the, you know, AMA and your seat flying off when you're driving down the road, you know, all those things that commonly happen. Um, you just get in the water and grab your paddle and you sit down and you go. Uh, you know, I think if you lived, for me, if you lived in an area where there was a consistent downwind run, I would love to have an outrigger. Um, you know, like Bill's been talking next door, he's been talking about getting a, uh, a, oc2 mm -hmm. and i'll definitely do it with him if he gets an oc2 um but i don't know like i said i i'm I, you know i'm glad i i'm open to any whatever you want to paddle I, i'm i'm cool with it mm -hmm. you know and if you want to paddle like a c1 you know marathon canoe or you want to paddle an outrigger or whatever I, I don't i don't care you're welcome to race with me and i'm i'll try to keep up with you um you know, like the fastest outrigger guys on flat water, they're a good target for me. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm not the fastest, you know, in the flat water mm -hmm. uh, or in, in the ocean either. You know, all of the fast outrigger guys smoke me in the, like at the gorge. Mm -hmm. They, oh, yes, they yeah. pass me like <laughs> I was standing still. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, in, in the flat water um, or, you know, mile chop, the fastest outrigger guys are a good target. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that I, I, anybody that's a good target for me, that will help me push myself to go a little faster. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited to, to battle with them. It's such a small community. You want everybody to battle. Right. Yeah. Um, I always like to try and spotlight some of the surf ski and kayak, um, motivations. Um, the majority of the community worldwide is single blade outrigger dragon boat. Those communities are much larger. So it's always good to spotlight what is the internal motivation for surf ski or kayaking because it is the slightly smaller group. And that being said, every outrigger paddler in the world would be interested in being a surf ski paddler with the right guidance, motivation, and kind of environment. So speaking of that environment of bringing your community together and paddling with everybody, speak to the Naples area community-driven meetups, which Justin helps organize and I think is the sole organizer. You got a neighbor that paddles. You mentioned Her Murray, the hurricane, Hunkin yeah. out there. Mark that stands <laughs> So tell us about your community and kind of the role that uh, you play in organizing that and how it affects, you know, most paddlers in your area. Um, you know, it, it's all really just good drives down to that. I want somebody to paddle with. Um, and, uh, you know, we all have quite a few of us happen to live on or near the Imperial River in Bonita Springs, which is kind of in between Fort Myers and uh, Naples, Florida. It's a, you know, shallow estuary kind of river. Um, it goes tidal. Uh, and uh, Wednesday nights, it just it works out. We can go from my house and uh, and we meet up in a central location and we just kind of Every Wednesday night, we, we race. And, um, you know, some nights we push it harder than others. But the idea is that consistency hopefully will pay off. Um, and like anything, you know, you, you'll get growth if, you can, if you're consistent about it. I think we had 14 or 15 people show up one night um, between SUP, Outrigger, and Surf Ski. Um, so, I mean, that was pretty exciting to have that many people show up on a Wednesday night after work, you know, and, 
and join us. Um, and I think that's the only way we're going to grow it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I talk to you all the time about scheming up ideas and you're maybe an enabler when it comes to buying things. Um, <laughs> I know if Jessica's watching. <laughs> that's right. Wife. Buy it, Justin. Do it. You only live once. It's his fault. <laughs> uh, no, you know, and I, so I think like, you know, going back to, you know, the team aspect of the outrigger, like I can see how that's very important for growth. Um, and that's why my next purchase is probably going to be a double surf ski that's stable. Mm-hmm. Um, we recently did a, you know, downwind run, which was probably towards the peak of my ability and my, I have a think ion, which is intermediate advanced. And it was probably towards the top of my ability in that. Um, and it was definitely beyond the ability of some of the people that came with me and got me thinking, I was like, you know, if I would have just had a stable double, we could have just had a blast, Mm -hmm. you know, and they would have gotten some opportunity to learn. Not that I have a lot to teach, but what I do have to teach, I am more than willing to share it. And, um, you know, I think getting a double surf ski is going to be great for helping growing the surf ski community, just like it is um, with OC6 and OC2 uh, and the outrigger community. Because in the end, we just want to steal all this up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so looking at the, um, oh, so if you're here on YouTube, if you look at Florida Gulf of Mexico downwind run, um, that's, I think we went out on the same day, actually, uh, that I yeah. had, we had 50 mile an hour gust up here and the gust winds weren't quite as bad down there. No. But if you're watching the video, that's an idea of, you know, this is pretty big water, man. And, that was and like, nobody does that around us. So when we were launching the ladies, like you aren't going out in that. I'm like, uh, yeah, we are. That's what these are for. <laughs> yeah, that was, it was, a, it was, I was in the OC one on that one. And it was like being in the surf ski, there's more, um, right and so you can catch more swells so i was struggling a little bit out there and it was on the the very limit of my uh comfort zone to the point where we've had a couple downwind since i'm like ah i'm caught up for the next month on yeah, like you yeah. know but looking at the double surf ski right so that's two people in one boat that's one of the major advantages that single blade boats have is you have a six person version imagine having a six person surf ski that would be crazy right well, we got the three person and then imagine a 20 person one Right. So if you could get 20 surf ski paddlers in one boat at the same time, they don't need to steer. They don't need to worry about flipping. It would expedite the growth because they can learn all these skills in a very controlled environment. And that's one of the disadvantages that uh, kayak paddling just does not have is that sort of craft. Right. And there's no way that it ever would. Right. So just understanding and how to work around that. But like you said, bringing the team component and giving your skill set to somebody else helps them develop then they can go by themselves and then eventually they can take somebody in a double and then like it kind of gets that domino effect going. Yeah. Yeah. It, well, you know, it's surf ski is not easy. You right. have to be tough. Right. I mean, I'm not saying I'm tough, but you have to have grit. Like it, it really like you can get an OC one and you can be competitive from sup right away. Mm-hmm. And a surf ski that doesn't happen. It's a, I mean, you, you're starting at the bottom mm-hmm. um, and everybody, that does it you know that there's decently quick it's up they're like well i'm just gonna get an intermediate surf ski mm-hmm. well you're not gonna do good i i spent a year falling out of my boat i probably can get i can probably argue i could probably get back in my boat faster than most people mm-hmm. maybe not anymore but for a while that was the, the, the case because i would fall out if a ripple went by mm-hmm. um and you know i would advise not starting with the intermediate surf ski get a beginner one or a beginner inter- intermediate mm-hmm. and um you know, you're just going to have to have a lot of determination and uh, grit to, to keep pushing through and learning it. Um, so, you know, like, that's another, I guess, argument is if you want to, if you want something, the quick satisfaction, get the OC, you know, if you're coming from sub. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the transition into OC, like you said, it's much less wet. Uh, Joe Serkovich, one of my favorite uh, quotes is the swim tax. Yeah. Everybody pays the swim tax. And that's one of the things that builds camaraderie within the surf ski community is when you see somebody that is making an elite ski look easy, you know that they've gone through all the trials and tribulations, right? Because it doesn't come, nobody gets in and masters it fast. It always takes a period of time. They've paid their swim tax. They've spent the time in the boat. And there's this instant camaraderie. In the OC, 
you can get in and you're in the fastest racing craft on the planet, no stability demand, lean left a little bit. And uh, that progression and that swim tax isn't as inherent because you don't know if that person's flipped a thousand times because they don't need to, right? Versus in the surf ski, that is a progression that it hits everybody, right? Yeah, yeah. So talking about the surf skis, right? Walk us through some of the equipment. So you've talked about the, uh, the white race Hovi board, the, uh, mahi, the mahi mahi board, and then you named some of the surf skis that you've used. Walk us through your equipment history, and Jessica, Justin's husband, do not watch this. <laughs> She's she doesn't she can't even keep track anymore. That's right, I can't even keep track, and I'm like I'm into it, and I like I, my list is it's completely full. This pack of the paper here, it's just full of names of boats. <laughs> I don't actually I don't remember all the ones I had, but <laughs> well, walk us through some of the highlights. I haven't bought many of them brand new. I I often will buy them secondhand because mm -hmm. I. It, you know, when there isn't a ton of them to try, you know, you don't know if it's going to work for you until you buy it. Sure. Um, and so I try to buy them at a fair price where I can sell them at a fair price if I don't like them. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Nellos seemed to work well for me for a while. Mm -hmm. So I stuck with Nello um, until they came out with the latest generation um, 560. Mm -hmm. I got, I ordered a custom one uh, and... I liked it, but I didn't like it the seat as much as the previous gen. Even mm -hmm. though it was, I think, a better boat because it was a little more stable, mm -hmm. um, surfed a little bit better, but the bucket was lower, and I just didn't really like the way it was shaped. So that kind of started this cycle of me going through boats, mm -hmm. and um, I think I've pretty much paddled or owned every brand now, mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, think boats have been the best for me in terms of the bucket. And I've heard a lot of people, I've never heard anybody say that a think bucket is uncomfortable to them. Yeah, I don't think I've heard that either. The only complaint with those buckets, um, if Chad Seiple's watching turn off, uh, is that it's a high seat. Like that's one of yeah. the, it, it's a comfortable seat because it sits high, but then you have this inherent tippiness that goes along with it. So that is one of the complaints that you would hear with like the Uno and the Uno Max is that, it's tippy, right? And it's like the game of surf ski in all of its designs and shapes is a give and a take, right? If it surfs better, it doesn't glide on flat water as good. If it glides on flat water well, it doesn't surf as well. And if it's not maneuverable, right, it means it goes faster. If it's, you know, uh, if it's tippy, it's likely the seat. If you don't feel like you have a good leverage, you might be lower in the seat. So it's always a give and a take. And each brand and model is always trying to find either a perfect balance or they just push the extreme they just make it you know the best surfing boat on the planet they make it the best flat water boat on the planet what's it like trying to navigate through these bands trying to find kind of the goldilocks of each one well you know for me it really the the whole deal of me getting new boats was all the seat mm -hmm. you know my my probably my favorite boat that i had um was up until recently was my uh my vega mm -hmm. um then but the problem with the vega is i had like within a mile I, my leg was numb mm -hmm. and i think it was just the, the shape of the bucket and how low it was and it was pretty tight um around my hips and i think something back there is whether it's a nerve or whatever it would just it would trigger it mm -hmm. um and then that segue and you know i got i paddled a, a fin uh elite s mm -hmm. i liked it a lot so i was like well i'm gonna get the phoenix version mm -hmm. and uh one popped up for sale. I got that, and same thing. Um, that boat was great too. Um, it wasn't quite as stable as the Vega. The Vega right. was the probably the best compromise between stability and speed. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it's fast because it's light and stiff, right? Um, and then it was pretty stable for an elite boat. Mm -hmm. um, up until recently, my fastest downwind mile was in a Vega. Mm -hmm. um, not it's not nothing impressive but for me it was my fastest um and then i kind of i got a um at chattajack i bought a think uno and i should have raced the race in in that because <laughs> i had a, <laughs> a fen uh swordfish s and i thought you know a little extra stability for the length of the race will help <laughs> the seat in that thing was horrible i love that boat that's probably i mean that's probably one of the all-time greatest all-around boats mm -hmm. um but the seat and that 
Fenix was just horrendous. It just was horrible. And I just dealt with it because I liked the boat so much. Right. Um, but the, the Uno is the only boat that I've, I'm way overweight for it, but, um, on, you know, Florida type of paddles, it's fine. But that's the only boat I could paddle for four hours and get out and not have any dead legs. Um, so what did I do? I, I sold it and I just dropped it off here. Somebody, <laughs> somebody's going to come pick it up from Georgia and, uh, I bought an NK. So we'll see if this progression, uh, continues. <laughs> yeah, so the seats is probably one of the biggest factors for consumers, right? And like you said, everybody's sit bones and posture is slightly different. Each bucket is molded slightly different. The heel to uh, sit bone ratio, even a millimeter, makes a big difference for people, especially over a long haul. Yeah. And that's I feel like that's one of the reasons that people end up being brand loyal is not necessarily the performance or the shape of the boat, but they're loyal to the comfort of the bucket, right? So when brands have the same cockpit boat to boat, I feel like that's one of the best universal things that they can bring because you have a consumer that uses one bucket, they love it, and they're looking for that. Then they're looking for something a little faster or narrower or wider, whatever. Um, but having like universal cockpits makes it easy for people to transfer through. I feel like that's one of the reasons that Epics have customers that start with the V8 and they make the progression all the way to the V12 or V14 yeah. is because a lot of those earlier gens, the cockpit is literally identical. Stellar is the same way as well, where, you know, you take some of the boats, like the S18, it's the same cockpit that's in, you know, the SEL or the SCS right. and so on. Well, Stellar Stellar has been making improvements on their buckets. And so that's the big difference with modern boats is when they come with a new generation, when they change that bucket, they might lose a consumer, right? Because people are, are loyal to like, oh, this worked. And then the new generation comes out, they sit in it, oh my God, my leg falls asleep, right? Because they're like the new V12, it's a little bit lower than it used to be, right? And that might deter some people to get in it. And they're like, ah, oh, I can't paddle this. Now they're looking at other brands and they make that swap right. over, right? So um, having universal buckets and seats that are comparable to each other kind of helps with that continuity with uh, somebody looking. And then if not, then they end up like Justin where they're seeking yeah. other brands and different size boats and whatnot. It, you know, and, and I think the difference between an elite ski, and you can speak to this, to an, uh, to a beginner ski, you know, if, if you're slow and you're paddling flat water and you can handle the balance of an elite ski, yeah, you're going to definitely be faster. But in the grand scheme of things, it's not that big of a difference. It's always proportional. So, like, you'll always proportionally go faster in the narrower boat if balance isn't an issue, right? But the proportion gets smaller the better you get. So, and I think that's what lures people away from it is when they're in their beginning stages, they go five miles an hour in this boat, but I go six miles an hour in this boat. That's a big jump, right? But once you're paddling over seven miles an hour, when you go back to the uh, boat that is wider, it's only like, oh, I'm still going like 6.7 miles per hour. So that's, that drop isn't as dramatic. Right. And when you look at the time, it's like, well, for 19 seconds per mile slower, I have absolute stability. And so depending on the situation you're in, if you're racing, maybe that adds up and it becomes important. But if you're just downwinding and having fun, 15 seconds per mile isn't that big of a deal for peace downwind, of mind. downwind, it's even less. Exactly. And that's the that's a big issue is like in downwind, you might be five seconds per mile difference, right? Or faster. And that's true with stability becoming a major factor in applying power and catching waves that you might not be able to. Um, and that's kind of the fun in navigating some of these different boats is wider is not always slower. And if it is slower, it's only the better you get, the smaller the proportion is. And um, you grow faster. And you do. And that's one of the big things we talk about on YouTube with the uh, technique and the stability video, uh, which is one of our most popular videos, actually, of people watching us fall out of the boat, is learning the fundamentals properly. When you're in the elite boat, you got to sit and you're fighting for your life and trying to barely move and your stroke isn't great versus in something wider, you can throw caution to the wind and have this great motion. And that's what makes a boat move fast is the paddler feeling comfortable, not the boat by itself. Yeah, I would say if you're starting, find a boat that fits you well and you're comfortable in and you can sit in it the whole time and then don't go wider than 20 inches. Or don't go narrower than 20 inches. Mm -hmm. You know, something in that 20 inch to 19 inch range, if you're going to paddle primary flat water, that's a great boat to start with. You know, do not, do 
you not do what I did and start with an 18 inch wide boat that had that was very tippy for an 18 inch wide boat um and then you know struggle and waste months of time where you could be learning the stroke instead of learning how to get back in yeah there's a lot of paddlers that start with something too tippy and work their way back most paddlers that are like of this like new school that have started in the last probably three years are urged to start in a wider boat i think uh amy keener is the perfect example of that where she started in something 20 inches wide and then went to 18 and a half and 18 and 17 and a half and now she's finally made it to 17 inches but that's one of the reasons for her meteoric rise in being fast is spending quality time making a boat move fast right and not right. worrying about the width until she's got this technique down pat then reaping the rewards of going faster from a, a boat that's narrower right and that's with race aspirations right so if you don't have race aspirations give up the 15 seconds per mile and just yeah. enjoy the sport so many people quit because it is so difficult because they've made it so difficult on themselves like oh i'll get the hang of this boat in two months and they didn't realize the timeline on learning that was two years, right? And somewhere within that, they're like, ah, I'm done with this. Like, I, yeah. I can't take this anymore. Yeah, I and mean, if you're worried about the money of it, you know, there's, if you get the 20-inch boat, like, say, the Epic uh, V8 Pro, mm -hmm. that has a cult following because of one race, the Chattajack. Mm -hmm. And if you buy that boat, there will always be a buyer for that. You know, there was a time when I was trying to buy one, and you can't get them. They, they, as soon as they come up for sale, they sell. So if you're going to buy one, you'll take a little bit of hit on depreciation, but that's a great boat to start with in Florida, you know, for most Florida type of races or, you know, flat water paddling. And it's fast. You know, I could be on my elite boat and you could probably still beat me on a V8 Pro. <laughs> you know? I, I don't know if that's exactly true. Well, like maybe, you know, shorter distance for sure. <laughs> so... That is, that is uh, a major point, though, and that's one of the reasons that outrigger boats hold their value so well is the market that they are applicable for is widest, right? 20-inch wide surf skis, anybody can use it. Oh, I want to get this for myself to learn. I want to get this for a friend. I want to get this for a family member. There's a lot of things. When you look at a 16-inch wide surf ski, who, who the hell is going to use it, right? So even when you go to sell it, there's like nine people that are like, oh, I want to buy this, but I already own a bunch of boats. So now the value on that starts to drop, you know, dramatically. Yeah. <clears throat> and, the, and the other thing is the reason why you can't find them is nobody sells them because they keep them for life. They're great, mm -hmm. you know. And I and I'm excited to see this Vega Arc coming out. Um, you know, I'm I'm a gear junkie. I'm gonna admit it. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have brand loyalty uh, per se. Um, if I am gonna buy new, I will buy from Jay. He is my friend. Um, but you know. I'm excited to see this thing because this could dethrone the legendary V8 Pro that hasn't changed in forever. Yeah. And it's funny, the V8 Pro, when you look at uh, those sales, it is only the east side of the United States where the sales are like crazy, right? And everywhere else in the world, it's not as popular because of some of the new boats like the V9. It surfs better, right? Yeah. So they redesign the rocker. And so on a worldwide scale, Singapore, Hawaii, Australia, where they're only surfing these boats. That's the, the choice, right? So a V8 Pro doesn't make sense outside in those uh, different regions. So it's funny, like you said, like depending geographically where you're at, it increases the resale price of some of these boats, which makes entering the market, it's not really like you're giving up anything. You're just allocating the money because you can always cash out on some of these boats yeah. later, right? Get well, all of my of boats it. have been like that. I, mm -hmm. I've bought really two boats and I just keep cycling that money to the new boats. Yep. Up until this boat, this is my my new uh, NK Nitro. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the most expensive boat, and the only time I've had to come out of pocket, you know, mm -hmm. for any extra money. Other than that, it's always been just cycling them. And as long as you take care of your boats, you're always going to be able to sell them. Right, and that's I think that's one of the other reasons that entering surf ski is it's daunting for many people because they'll understand what they're getting into. Right, I need a wide boat. And just like we talked about, at a certain point, you're going to want to, you'll graduate from that and want something narrower, but there's potentially three, four, or five steps. And when you make it to the fifth step, now navigating all these different elite skis that are all very similar in characteristic, but one's good at this and one's good at that, which one do I need? And trying to find all of that. 
people in their mind are like, oh, God, I got to buy like seven boats brand new. And that's not the best way to think about it. If you buy your first one used, right, if you're uh, in that situation, when you reallocate that money, you sell that one, you cash out, you should get most of what you paid for it. And then from there, move it on to the next one and progress in that manner. With Outrigger Canoe, I feel like that's one of the reasons people feel safer with entering into that is it's one boat. When you buy the boat, it is one of the best ones on the planet. There's minimal changes that you will ever have to go through. And if you do, it's only a second boat, not three, four, five. Right. And, you know, uh, the, the canoe world is starting to kind of turn into the sub world. <laughs> you keep seeing them make new changes. And this is the fastest boat, you know, ever. And this AMA is going to be faster, less drag. And, <laughs> True. You know, you know the, in the sub world, they can cut the thing out of foam and they have CNC machine. You know, if you're, if you're in the market for a custom, you know, sub, uh, flying fish is the way to go, mm-hmm. you know, because they have a CNC machine in house. They make them there in, in Stewart, Florida, and you can get whatever you want. And the issue with that is, is that they're always evolving mm-hmm. constantly. So it's you see, you know, subs go for pretty cheap. They they depreciate really quick, sure. you know. And once I guess our, our canoe, the outrigger canoe gets there, they might start doing the same, you know. Um, but the real reality is, is that the old, uh, hurricane OC one is really probably just as fast as anything out that's out now. Um, you know, and the same kind of goes for surf ski, mm-hmm. you know, and probably you could say the same about SUP, except for now SUPs are like 19 inches wide and it's pretty mm-hmm. tough to, you know, beat a 19 inch wide board on a 27 inch wide board. But yeah, the optimization of shapes. Probably in the last, the hurricane is a funny one because it came out in like 2000 and like two and it was way ahead of its time, right? So like all the subsequent boats that came out after the hurricane didn't strike the same magic that that boat did for uh, quite a while. But that's one of the advantages that uh, Outrigger has had is you don't have a stability to make, right? So when you design a boat, you can design it exactly how you want and stability is no question, right? And so they were able to optimize that shape a while ago, right? So they have a pretty good idea of what they're trying to do for surfing, right? That was the main thing. Now with the the Draco now trying to make this into a flat water uh, style boat to try and appeal to a different demographic that may never go to the ocean. So talking about flying fish, so we talked about Hovi Sub, right? And that was an hour in my day. Hovi Sub was the first generation of the flying fish, right? And then flying fish came after. It's Florida based, right? Custom boards, yeah, super light carbon boards. Like you pick them up and you're like, wow, this thing's amazing. Oh, and I can get it in a size that fits my weight. So there's a lot of parallels between Hovi and Flying Fish. What is your perspective on seeing Hovi, the comparisons to Flying Fish, and what has Flying Fish done that Hovi couldn't do? Um, you know, well, Hovi was he was building his boards. Um, there was a guy in California, which was he's an extremely talented dude that was glassing the boards over there. And uh, and then they were shipping them here, mm-hmm. you know, with what Flying Fish is doing, you know. And I funny story is I met John at Key West, and it was one of those years. I was on SUP, he was on SUP, and it was just horrendously windy, and it was just miserable. We were coming out of Cal Key Channel, and we we're sitting next to the highway there, in between this little mangrove island and and the highway, and we're drinking our water, and we're just thinking, man, this is. I was like, this is gonna suck, and he's like, yeah. He's like, I don't want to <laughs> do this. I probably was spent more time on my knees from that point to the finish than I had ever on on a on a sup. But I think with what he's doing with the CNC, he's keeping sup alive. Sure. And 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 in their area, what their their what I wish I could do with my Wednesday night things, their Wednesday or Tuesday night, right? <laughs> Tuesday night. Tuesday race night league, race yeah. league. They have like a hundred subs. Mm-hmm. That's bigger than any sub race in the United States at this point, and they're doing it weekly, right? And then without him and what he does for the community, it would be dead. And I, I really do think that that there there's sup has gotten far too expensive for what it is. Mm-hmm. You know, like the starboards and all these Chinese or you know Korea or wherever they're made, mm-hmm. Taiwan, uh, they're too expensive. You know, for a sub. Sure, and um, and and you can argue the same that ozone boats and the uh, all the surf skis are ridiculously expensive now, mm-hmm. um, and there's no reason for it. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, if I was going to get another sup, you know, I would probably want an unlimited just to have that little bit extra speed. And, uh, you know, and I would definitely, I, I wouldn't consider anybody else, but, but John, um, he's, he's a good guy and they'll build you what you want. Mm -hmm. And you know, what more could you ask? Yeah, so um, I'm hoping to have Jeremy Vane on, who helps with the Tuesday Night Race League, and um, and I probably try to trick John into coming on and talking as well. Um, one of the topics, uh, and I agree, like it, if you were to remove that Jupiter crew from the sub world, Florida would be dead. Like it would be at like there's like oh there's like six or seven paddlers in Orlando, and there's like five paddlers in Tampa when those areas used to blossom and have like fifty or sixty yeah. or more. So now it's it's really like you said because they have the manufacturer there. There is this inherent community that is built around it, and it's allowed to grow. Um, and their weekly meetup, you know, really speaks to that. One thing, right, is the sub community in general is held up on a specification, which is fourteen feet. And I feel like not uh, speaking to um, that race league, but just on a worldwide scale, that has been one of the biggest hindrance with the sport in general is your customization and your ability to do amazing things with a blueprint is spec to 14 feet right and just like you said oh man if the sport went to unlimited i would get another board and try it again i'm the same way i have a freaking unlimited in my garage and i'm waiting i'm waiting for 14 foot to end so i can take that thing out and go for it right because i know like i go faster than a professional because the board is three feet longer Right. You can't convince me that 14 foot is a good thing when I can go so much faster with three feet more of carbon. Like, it's so ridiculous to hold up the sport and it's like, we're just going to go six miles an hour. Oh, the really fast guys are 6.2. Dude, take out the unlimited and it's like 6.7 just because the shape yeah. is a little bit longer. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it, it should be just like, I mean, you, you like, if you look at surf ski, the variance in sizes is huge, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think a hundred pound female doesn't need to be on a 20 foot long paddleboard, you know, maybe a 14 or a 15 would be perfect for, mm -hmm. you know, um, but a 200 pan, 200 pound man that maybe not as fit that extra glide of having that longer board could may make it more enjoyable. It'd make it a little faster. Um, you know, I paddled a Kings Unlimited once mm -hmm. and uh the that was the fastest time I ever had on a on a on a sup on our little four mile course that we do. Mm -hmm. I, I think I averaged like five and a half miles an hour. Normally I'm like dying to do five point two, you know. So it gets me a little bit closer to what the pros are, which they're doing like now they're doing like six mm -hmm. or a little bit over. Yeah, and with uh surf ski right like it an outrigger canoe too like they're not bound by a spec it's just show up in whatever and race it and it it's a flourishing community worldwide right and then sup is like on this brink where it's like i feel like the people that were successful because of the 14 foot board are still in the sport and they're holding on to it like it has to stay this way because if it changes it changes the thing that made me where i am today right yeah. and i can understand that fear and in the world of surf ski and outrigger canoe I would love it if the boards went to some arbitrary small spec. If surf skis were 14 feet, I'd be the freaking world champion because I can get into a 16 inch wide by 14 because I'm so small and it negates all these tall, lanky guys. They can't fit in a boat unless it's like, you know, super wide, right? So I feel like removing that specification allows people to find vessels that are good for them to compete, right? right? And then that's the ultimate equalizer is finding something that works for you. And then your skill is the thing that makes it work. And really, all the manufacturers should be fighting for that because that just means they're going to sell more boards. Yep. Think and about so, all these people that have been holding on to their fourteen that they've had for three years. Well, now you're going to make them. You're going to make a sixteen or a seventeen. They're going to be like, "Well, I got to get that, or I'm going to get smoked." And that's exactly right. If they remove the specification and allow, and then board manufacturing could like renaissance again because everybody goes back to the drawing board on what the hell do we do? Right? Do we do pintails? Do we have square tails? How long do we make the nose? How short? How long is the cockpit? How much of a dugout? So they have to go back to being creative to making something that is very, you know, unique. Right now, I'm not going to lie, a lot of subs, they've become optimized, right? So this is a flat water dugout. This is a flat water dugout. 
they look really similar right now, right? Yeah. Because with 14 feet, there's only so much you can do within that blueprint. Remove all specifications, and now maybe you can get away with a 19-inch wide board. If it's 19 feet long, maybe the stability is more applicable for people, or they can even make it narrower. There's so many opportunities that all equate to higher-end performance that bring back people into the sport, right? If a if you have to be on a 19-inch, 14-foot with no rudder in side wind, the amount of skill that takes is so daunting. Then you get in a surf ski. I want to go right, push the pedal right. I want to go left. So that in, eliminates an entire skill, and now you only have to deal with maybe the balance and you know yeah. so on. Right? And la- last year at Key West, you know, coming into the finish, it was it was sporty. I would mm-hmm. say, you know, very. I mean, you know, somebody overseas, if they're listening, they're going to be like, "Well, that's like a no- nothing day." But for Florida <laughs> standards, it was like washing machine and probably two to three foot, mm-hmm. and on a twenty inch wide sub. That is a workout, mm-hmm. and everybody I passed, um, they get a you know I think a thirty minute head start, or mm-hmm. right? Maybe yeah, it's less than that. Um, so you don't really pass the fat, fast people until you're back into the Atlantic Ocean, mm-hmm. and um, and for those you don't know, Key West is a, a rounding of the island mm-hmm. basically. Uh, it's about twelve miles, and uh, it's only like ten and a half. 10, oh, whatever. It's advertised as 12, but like every time I get done, it's like 10.6. And, like, yeah. <laughs> and this year is going to be the last year. Yes. So hopefully everybody comes that's listening. Um, I would like it to be the best, biggest year. It's my favorite race. I would do this race over Chattajack any day of the week. So speaking to that, that's the next thing I got on the list mm. is races. And what do you like and dislike in races? What are you looking for when, when you see a race? What are the things that kind of gravitate you to attending versus deciding like, ah, maybe not? Um, well, I think the best race in the United States, by, bar none, is the Gorge. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's a whole week, and there's people from all over the world, and it's a whole week of downwinding, no paddling upwind, no paddling, grinding it out on flat water, although there's sometimes there's flat water days. There's shuttles, you know, there's, everybody's stoked to be doing it. You know, you got you got tons of outrigger guys and uh, surf ski guys. I think last year or maybe the year before, they had more outriggers than they had surf skis. Mm-hmm. Um, they have strong clubs over on the West Coast, right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, there was I met people from South Africa, from Australia, you know, all different parts of the United States, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know that put that that whole week is just it's just a blast Mm -hmm. um the issue is coming from florida which is the literally the opposite corner of the united states it's expensive well you're not going to drive it it's only 48 hours one way if i could get somebody to do it with me (laughs) but you know um you know by the time you ship a boat or rent a boat and then lodging and then all the stuff that goes into it you know i think i was almost ten thousand dollars last time i went and Mm -hmm. you know that's a tough pill to swallow for a week vacation you know when i gotta convince my wife and my you know my five-year-old that this is a great vacation for them too uh you know although you get to do you can like the wind doesn't come up until the afternoon um because it's that cool you know pacific air getting sucked mm-hmm. up the canyon uh to the hot you know dry plains and um and then it's going the opposite direction of the current mm-hmm. um so the waves just get huge and it's it it's if you haven't done it, it's it's a bucket list thing to do. Mm-hmm. I don't care where you live in the United States or in the world for that matter. It's a great place to go, you know. But at that kind of expense, you know. Granted, I could do it a whole lot cheaper than that. But um, at that kind of expense, I could probably go to the race week in Australia for mm-hmm. about the same amount of money, you right. know. Um, if if it was still as big as it used to be you know the molokai would be a great one Mm -hmm. Uh, last year didn't seem like it was all that much um not worth spending the money to go do it sure um although it's still a bucket list you know race but in in terms of florida uh key west is always my favorite because it's like a destination race it's Mm -hmm. somewhere cool and fun to go to you know there's lots of fun things to do you know if you like drinking there's a lot of that to do <laughs> that's part of the but, race organization they give you liquor there's yeah. uh there's beer registration the day before there's yeah. beer afterwards yeah. yeah it's a big party island mm-hmm. um but it's got a lot of history and if you like diving or anything it's you know a beautiful place to go 
Um, but then, you know, then there's Chattajack. Uh, and Chattajack is one of those races that you hate. Uh, you swear you'll never do it again. <laughs> then, yeah, you keep doing it. And I think the reason why is because of the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I didn't do it last year because I fell asleep. <laughs> Before you have to register like the hour that it opens. Yep. And I fell asleep before and I got on the wait list and I got to literally number one on the wait list the day before the race. So (laughs) I probably could have showed up and I probably could have got in, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I I hadn't really committed to it because at that point I didn't think I was going to get in. Um, And that's something you definitely need to prepare for a 32 mile flat water race Mm -hmm. that you may have. Freezing cold temperatures, you may have current helping you along, you may not. Um, and it seemed like you didn't have the current last year, and then you had uh, lots of boat traffic, so lots of uh, waves and, you know, reverberation, and uh, and uh, it was warm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so not to rub it in, but um, if people don't know, there's a short list of, you have Chattajack winners, and then you have course record holders, and then you have the people that are the first to register at midnight. And I was number one. I am race registrant number one. I I completed all the paperwork inside of a minute. I did it in 32 seconds. I timed myself. Click, click, click. And I was like, if somebody beats me, they're using a computer program. So Justin didn't make it in, but yeah, I was number number one on that. I so, feel so, like last time I was pretty close. I, I was within a minute, I'm sure. I think I, I almost want to email him and ask, like, how many people do it inside of a minute? Because I bet you it's like, probably 50 percent of the initial participants like 300 people probably get in a minute and i think it's just like luck to get the you know you you have like a nine-way tie for first and then it's just part of the uh you know which electrical signal got sent first so looking at um some of these races so you have the international and pedigree aspect of the gorge right that's a huge draw um destination panels with interesting race courses right key west Super cool, circumnavigating that, going by downtown and looking up and seeing the square. It's a very cool course. And then you have something that is a little bit more atmospheric with um, the the regional art, not international so much. It's growing, I guess, with Chattajack. So um, looking at all these, right, like if you were to tailor some sort of like perfect race, right, what would be something that comes to mind on like a location, some sort of course, and what would be the distance to try and capture all these people, maybe a time of year. If you were to fabricate some perfect race, what would it be? Uh, you know, a downwind race is as good as it gets. Mm-hmm. You know, and I I've, I know I've said this to you before, and I may offend the race director on this, but we had one race in Florida where it was a downwind race, mm-hmm. and everybody shuttled. And it was great. It was an awesome race. What race was that? The Neptunalia, or whatever it is oh, called. Oh, yeah, 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 Danny Smith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a great downwind race. And then at the very end, because it had to be the exact mileage that was advertised, we had to go up this retarded creek <laughs> that was, like, super shallow. And by that time, I was spent, and I thought I was done. And then I realized I had to go up this creek, and, like, it was it's narrow there was it was low tide there was oyster bars everywhere and and uh, like i got passed by a bunch of people that i had already passed and i was like i was <laughs> so deflated and it ruined the race for me and you know like i think it ruined it for a lot of people a lot of people were mad about it um and it was you know like that was that would have been probably one of the greatest races in florida's history to have an actual downwind race <laughs> and got ruined because you had to have the mileage right. So looking at downwind races, obviously one of the big logistical hurdles is you have to do it in Florida, especially it has to be a window, right? Yeah. And then it's like an on-call, like, hey, we have potentially favorable conditions tomorrow morning, right? And like lining that up on a Saturday or Sunday, it might be like an eight-week window, and you may only get three to five days of notice on that being potential. So like the gorge, they can almost guarantee that there's going to be wind and most people will complain like oh it's flat because it's only 25 mile an hour winds not 70 or something right and so having environments that don't cater to um that consistency ultimately for a race director they can't guarantee that they're going to have the numbers right they may have awesome conditions 
but it's a it's like you know a Saturday. Yeah. It's Easter weekend, right? Nobody right. can make it, right? Yeah. And that's that. No, I mean the only place we have trade wins is really in the Keys. Really? Like that would be usable. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and I think I think that's why it's been pretty consistent since they moved Key West to September. Mm-hmm. There always seems to be a wind coming sure. coming from the east. Right. And uh, you know, it makes that Atlantic portion a little sporty, and you know, a, a downwind lake per se. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the angle varies depending on what the weather pattern is, but you know, that's. It's consistent of a wind where I, I can think of where you could do a downwind. Mm-hmm. And I think in the Keys in general, because you're so far out there, that's the only place you could. But the issue is, is it's not a lot of good point to point. There's no beaches in the Keys. It's all like lime rock. You know, mm-hmm. it's a reef that's exposed, basically. Right. And um, so that really limits Florida in that sense. Um, so the only next thing you have is natural beauty. Mm-hmm. Um, which is what we're doing tomorrow, the the Wiki Wachi race, right? You know, it doesn't get much more pretty than that in terms of a race venue or a course. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's beautiful, crystal clear water, and you know, it's a free race at the FCPA um, hosts it, and you know, that's another great thing, you know, that you can do in Florida, mm-hmm. and it's welcome. Everybody's welcome to do it, no matter what craft, um, you know. So, I mean, what is a great race for Florida? I, th- I think a lot of the FCPA races, the Rainbow River and uh, Wiki are, you know, definitely top on the list. They're free. They don't, you know, make a big, you know, they're trying to make money off you, um, you know, or give you, you know, dumb, you know, finish our medals that you <laughs> throw away or maybe you collect them and hang them on your wall. I don't know. But, you know, like you just, you just go and you race and, you know, it's normally the same crowd, um, and it's normally in a cool spot that's scenic and, you know, in the nature of Florida. The only downside is it's always flat water. Yep. Yeah, and that's one of the things that holds a lot of people back is they want textured water, right? So I, I feel like races that are in any kind of open water scenario attract more paddlers. And the FCPA, it, and they do it on purpose, the races are almost like under the radar. Right. And the problem is some of these parks and rivers are not designed for like 150 racers. Like if you if we advertise it enough for Rainbow River, we could have almost 200 people out there making a big venue and stuff. But how the hell does it work? Like the start line's not big enough. Right. You'd have to like you'd have to go in stages. And then the river itself cannot handle that many people flying up and down it. We wouldn't even be able to make it up to the top. And so like it's designed even Wiki Wanchi, it's kind of designed where it's just like you're in an exclusive club if you hear about right. it and get the yeah. registration because they only want 30 to 40 people even tomorrow we might have 50 and it's going to be hectic as a result right so there's always a give and take so talking about downwind races one of the things that i wanted to go over before we got done is justin's got a cool story about close calls and safeties <laughs> and nello 550s so yeah walk us through one of your downwinding experiences some of the safety procedures that you did do and didn't do and how it went, and how it became a memorable podcast experience. So I, I think this is it was probably my first true downwind where we're doing a point to point. And for where we live, you got two options. There's a cold front coming, so the wind is coming, getting pulled to the north, which is nice because it's warm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's typically you know eighty degrees. Um, or you wait till the front passes, and then you got the north wind, mm-hmm. which is cold. You know, and it may not be cold to most people, but to Florida people, it's cold. You know, it's it was, I think, this day we're talking about, I think it was in the upper 50s, low 60s when we started, and it was dropping quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I uh, had just gotten this 550, and I was like, you know, one of the guys we paddled with, Matt, was on Outrigger Canoe, and uh, um, I think James and another guy were on, sup but they were experienced you know downwind and Mm -hmm. you know rough water paddlers and then um i think there was one or two other people um cindy was one of them and cindy was the closest one to me when this incident happened Mm. and uh so basically long story short i fell off and i didn't have a leash because i didn't own one 
I didn't even own a, I didn't even own a life jacket. Oh my god. I was Jay Jay luckily probably saved my life because of this. He was like, "You're taking this life jacket until you buy one." Mm-hmm. Um and, and he's like, yeah, "I think I ended up buying the Maki jacket from mm-hmm. him." Um but he gave me the one to use until the, in the meantime. And then uh it was. I was shivering before we got on the water, and James, I think, had an extra wetsuit top, mm-hmm. so I put that on. But I still had board shorts on. Um, we were about probably a mile in, and I was struggling. I think I fell off once, and but I was still kind of close to the group. Um, and then we got a little bit further down, and we were probably half a mile off the beach at this point because the way the curve it curves, and uh, I fell off, got back on, then lost my sunglasses, tried to grab them before they sank, and then I fell off again. And at that time, I wasn't I didn't have my foot hooked into the foot strap. Remember, I don't have a leash. And a big gust of wind came and poof, there goes my boat. I'm like, crap. I'm like, I can't swim fast enough to catch this thing. Mm-hmm. So I start throwing my paddle at the boat and swimming as fast as I can. As soon as I get close, another gust of wind would take it. I'm like, ah. Oh. So I was like, at this point, I was like, all right, I need to conserve energy, and I need to get back to shore. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't want to lose my paddle because I just bought it. That It was a bracha, and, you know, they're expensive. Mm-hmm. So I held onto the paddle, and I flipped onto my back, and I just started kicking. And I stuck the paddle up in the air like a sail, and I was <laughs> moving about one mile an hour. Mm-hmm. So probably not the best idea. I probably could have swam, you know, to shore a lot quicker uh, <laughs> if I wasn't trying to save my paddle. Um, and if I would have took a direct line to the beach. Mm-hmm. But the issue is where we were is kind of like a park, and the park was closed. And it was like it's an island. Mm-hmm. So if I would have swam straight to shore, which would have been the fastest option, I would have still had to get back in the water to, to cross a pass mm-hmm. to get to where my boat was going, mm-hmm. which was kind of towards where the buildings were. Um, luckily, the wind was you know slightly on shore. So I swam for about an hour before I made it to shore. and. I didn't realize it until I got to shore, but I was like hypothermic. Sure. And when I got out of the water, I could I was shivering uncontrollably. I could not I had no motor skills. Mm-hmm. And the guy's like, Oh, I some guy from his condo watched me coming in. Right. And he's like, I saw your boat, I think it's up the, the beach away. So we walked it was almost a quarter mile up the beach, mm-hmm. you know, nestled in between a bunch of rocks. And uh um I went back and I got the Got the boat with the guy. We walked to the road, and I didn't have a cell phone either. So this is another strike. Uh, and uh, the guys at that point had all finished, and um, and they were like, "Oh, where's Justin?" Mm-hmm. And uh, I eventually the guy helped me out, took me up to his house, gave me a towel, warmed me up a little bit, and then uh, gave me a ride down the beach to where those guys were, and then we, you know, facilitated the pickup and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was a close call, you know. Uh, my wife was pregnant at the time and you know it was it would have not been a great a good thing um after that we changed strategy a little bit we started doing like a buddy system mm-hmm. um you know and we kind of uh were smarter about it you know there's there's a lot of things that went wrong there i i was in a tippy boat that i shouldn't have been in mm-hmm. in rough conditions you know it was probably it wasn't a crazy day it was maybe two two foot three mm-hmm. foot seas um so it wasn't insane, but it was insane for my ability at the time. Mm-hmm. And then not having the proper safety equipment. If there's one thing that you want to have is a leash. Absolutely. A PFD is definitely encouraged, mm-hmm. but I would take a leash over a PFD on most days mm-hmm. because the PFD would have PFD ultimately saved me, but if I wouldn't have lost my boat, mm-hmm. I could have held on to that. Right. You know. Um but I guess if you get knocked unconscious, then... Right, yeah, you know. and we don't normally wear... Like, the Vicobis and stuff are not designed to keep your head afloat. Right, so... Right. You, so, in that scenario for most paddlers... So, unless you're using something that has, like, the crotch strap and then, like, you know, the, the more padding and cushioning. Crust. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then, depending on the day that you paddle with that in Florida, unless it's super cold, your chances of dying of heat stroke go way right. up. Right. Yeah. And then the cold water is probably the biggest danger in that scenario, right? When you have a life jacket, your ability to float is extended hours, but you're right. on a time limit because of the cold water. Well, the water. water wasn't 
the water was taking the heat out of me, but the water, you know, our cold water is still in the 60s. Correct. You know, maybe upper 50s, but most of the time it's in the 60s. Mm-hmm. You know, so I was not that bad until I got out of the water. Sure. As soon as I got out of the water, I had no energy, and then I was already cold, and then that cold air, which was like now in the low 50s, mm-hmm. is ripping across, and it's humid, so you're not, like, the water's not evaporating. Right. You know, you, it was just a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, honestly, when I got out, the first I wanted to just bury myself in the sand for a minute. Sure, absolutely. That's all I, that was all I was thinking. And if that guy wasn't there, that's probably what I've done. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah, that was um, an awakening moment. And honestly, I still like at the gorge, for instance. The first time I went to the gorge, I still had that like antsy anxiety mm-hmm. from that incident at the gorge because the gorge is intimidating there's there's rocks and big walls and there's gill nets and like you know for the salmon along the sides that you mm-hmm. don't want to get tangled in right the current's going one way the wind's going the other way you know it's intimidating um and especially the first time i went i went on a 560 mm-hmm. you know that was all that was available to rent which was you know dumb you know <laughs> it was <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't fall the whole week, but I think it maybe I fell once. But it, but you know it was just not it wasn't fun mm-hmm. because of that boat. Um, you know, it it wasn't until recently where I started to like, you know, now I just I don't think about it anymore and I just enjoy it. Um, but I think it's important. You gotta you gotta push past things that you know scare you and uh, you know intimidate you, and and I think that's one thing you do get with surf ski is it's it's kind of scary you know, like it's a hard thing to learn you know in a lot of different ways yeah. and uh that's why i love it you know it's you know it's a great way to push yourself and you know from a guy that just was into cars and still is um you know it's something different and and kind of similar in a ways it's gear related you like you like cars you like gear mm-hmm. you know whether it's tools parts or whatever you know um, and you kind of can get that still with the paddling, mm-hmm. but then you also get the nature and the exercise and all that stuff. Yeah, with the uh, the close call, that's going to be an episode that uh, me and Christina do where we sit here and read horror stories, right? So people that may not want to come onto the show and have a whole episode, we're going to try and encourage them to send us some uh, close call moments and then yeah. kind of read them and go analyze some of the safety aspects, right? When you have those close calls, there's always, if I had done this or this, and for a lot of us, we can have this conversation because you survive, but there's a lot of people that don't make it and don't get to say, oh man, I wish I had had this or this, yeah. or maybe this was the thing. So we can only talk to people that have had those close calls and have learned from it. And I think that's important for all communities is to have somebody that has had that close call to like extra remind people like, right. like don't go out there with no if you jacket. If you paddle ocean... 100% you've had a close call. Mm-hmm. You paddle on Florida backwater, you might have had a close call with an alligator. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, Florida backwater is pretty shallow. And right. When you're close to shore, it's easy to get out. And, but if you paddle in the ocean, I don't care who you are, you've probably had something that scared you at least once. So, Justin, thank you so much for making the trip up here, coming on the podcast, inspire me to do the podcast. It's been a lot of fun uh, talking to people. I'm the idea guy. I'm not the guy that does the things. <laughs> well, now you're on the thing. So, <laughs> so uh, Justin, is there anything that you want to say to people watching? You want to say Mark Athanasio's name one more time? <laughs> Try to pronounce it. No, I just want I want more SUP people to give Surf Ski a try. I want Outrigger guys and girls to give Surf Ski a try. Um, I think you'll like it. You know, I'm not trying to steal, like, because all in the end, we're all in the same community, and the better each one of the facets of the community does, the better they all do. You know, and, and they all have good moments and and bad, but um, ultimately, I just want the community to grow. Because without the community growing, we're gonna lose all of our races, which we're already losing. Sure. So. Cool. All, all right. right, that concludes the paddle pursuit. We will see you guys next Monday for our next episode.